Tu, obviamente, é falar em inglês uh, e a gente não conhece em inglês, of course. Uh, professor Michael Miller uh, is for some days a teacher in Brazil. He has learned a bit of Portuguese, but not enough to, to give a talk. <laughs> So it's a great pleasure and an honor to welcome Professor Moore here in the University of São Paulo and the Faculty of Law. Um, it's a great honor because uh, uh, Professor Moore has an enormous contribution to legal theory and philosophy of law. And um, he's a leading theory not only in philosophy of law, but also in, as a, a leading theoretician in criminal law and he has many, uh, several uh, important books on the field relating um, the analysis of the morality of law, for instance. Um, uh, he has uh, been, his work has been recently discussed in a fast shift, which is called Legal, Moral and Metaphysical Truth, the philosopher of Michael Moore, published by Oxford University. And uh, so we can, uh, uh, from this, address the importance of his um, uh, work. Um, today, he uh, is going to um, give a talk about one particular field of interest, which is related to criminal law, but is actually um, concerned with agency and responsibility. He has uh, uh, altered uh, the book Law and Psychiatry Rethinking the Relationship in 1984, which is an important uh, book. And actually, nowadays, he's working on a new book which comes from this first work and develops the, the, the arguments and the ideas with the contributions uh, from uh, contemporary neuroscience. And the book's called, it's going to be called uh, Mechanical Brains and Responsible Choices. So it's a, a great opportunity to uh, hear, to talk, hear, to, to hear uh, Professor Moore talk. Uh, since it's an opportunity to, to see and, and, and discuss our work in progress, which is, will certainly be, be a landmark in the field. Thank you, Juliana. Really nice to be here in um, a lovely room today. So, it's, uh, the emperor's room, I understand. This is great. <laughs> Some of you are really gluttons for punishment. Uh, this is my third lecture in three days in Sao Paulo, and I've seen some of you of all three. So, um, thank you for the compliment of your attendance. Um, I am um, going to take a line from Roberto Unger. He started one of his classes at Harvard that Ronnie Morgan and I sat in on. Literally, the first sentence was, in Roberto's dramatic, in the Theotetus, he said. Well, in the Theotetus, Socrates makes this lovely comparison between lawyers and philosophers. And one of the things he says lawyers are driven by, by virtue of being lawyers, is he says the waters of Clepsydra, which is a little spring off the Agora in Athens, are always driving them because they have court calendars to meet clients' interests to meet them. They have deadlines. They have decision under time constraints. But philosophers, in which I would now include legal theorists, um, I think here in Brazil you guys have the Socratic attitude, which has really been an enjoyment. And I've been, I think, probably abusing it and indulging myself. There's no natural limit, as I can see, <laughs> to the end of these lectures. You follow the topic as long as the topic demands. And that's been a real pleasure. And in most places like Germany, England, and the United States, you've got someone sitting here with a little time clock, and he's handing you cards about how many minutes you have left, and it tends to cramp the style. This is very nice. It's relaxed. Um, and as long as I don't bore you to death, I'll keep talking for a while. Okay. So this talk does complement the talk that was given yesterday. I see that Lucas has a handout that says neuroscience and responsibility, some specific aspects of the project. That's a perfect title. Because yesterday at PUC, SB, I had given an overview of 
of this book that is mostly done, 90% done, for Oxford University Press on neuroscience and responsibility. I did three things yesterday in previewing what the book was about, which is roughly the first half of the book, first eight or 16 chapters. I went through what is actually specifically being challenged by contemporary neuroscience, and I'll say just enough for those of you who weren't at that lecture so you can bring yourself up to speed. But what is being challenged is actually an ordered three out of three things. What is being directly challenged are certain justice-oriented legal institutions like retributive punishment, natural right theories of property, and so forth. But underlying those approaches to law is secondly a kind of morality the morality in terms of which, since the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle, we've used to ascribe responsibility, what Joseph Perez calls ascriptive morality. The morality so that says no matter what the kind of wrong is you're doing, that you do it requires you to have a voluntary act for a mission for which there's a duty that in fact approximately causes a bad state of affairs when you intend to do it, and you're an accountable agent, and you don't have one of those circumstances that makes a normally bad act not bad that we call justifications, and you don't have one of those circumstances that made choice so hard that you're making a wrongful choice as excuse, we call excuses. All of that, that's basically a first year from the law course in virtually every Western country in the world, usually called the general part of the criminal law. So the second thing that's challenged is morality. The third thing, is the folk psychology on which that morality and thus that law depends. And that's actually where the rubber hits the road. Neuroscience challenges the view of persons as actors who do voluntary acts for certain sorts of reasons, form intentions out of their belief desire sets of a certain kind, and those belief desire intention sets cause the behavior that can be praiseworthy or blameworthy depending on whether it's good or bad. That folk psychology is the thing that neuroscience challenges and by virtue of that challenge, challenges the morality and the law that's built upon it. Um, that was the first thing I did. The second thing I did was say, so what's the data of neuroscience that makes this challenge? And out of all the vast literature of the last 50 years, which is far too much for any human to read, um, I isolated three sets of data. The data that showed how mental states are related in some intimate way to brain states, and particularly the mental states we care about, the ones that initiate actions we call willings and intentions, and the ones that exercise self-control, the ones we call executive control functions, how those are related to brain states. I secondly gave the data about how the experiments of the last 50 years have been attempting to show that before you know you've made a decision, Brain scientists can tell you what the decision is by looking either at electrical signals in your supplementary motor area, or more recently in the studies in Berlin, looking at the blood flow patterns in the parietal cortex. John Dylan Haynes, two valued decisions, 71% accuracy, can tell you seven seconds before you can know what you're going to decide what you're going to decide. That gets people kind of excited. There's that set of experiments. The third set of data is the data showing that people just don't know themselves as well as they thought they did. That was Freud's old claim that the new psychologists have new bases for making it. The new bases have to do with the fact that we're not infallible. We make mistakes both ways. Sometimes we act and don't know that we're acting. Sometimes we think we're acting, but we're not really acting. A famous book called The Illusion of Conscious Will that is simply running through all of these cases. Okay, that's the data. The third thing I did, and the last thing yesterday, was to isolate out of those three sets of data four challenges. What I call the challenge from physical reductions, and we're just machines. The challenge from determinism. Our choices are cause, so we could not have made a choice any other way than the way we made it. How could we be responsible if we couldn't have done otherwise? The challenge from epiphenomenalism. This isn't the challenge that our choices are caused, it's the challenge that our choices do no causing. That's a direct challenge to responsibility because if we cannot effectuate changes in the world that correspond to the objects of our intentions, we don't have control over the world needed for responsibility. That's called the epiphenomenal challenge because the challenge is our choices look like causes, but they're fake causes. They're epiphenomenal rather than causal of the actions that are therapeutic objects. 
And the last challenge I call the fallibilist challenge, which is you don't know yourself as well as you think you do. You need knowledge for control, and you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the control. Those are the four challenges. So I said at the end of that lecture, to understand whether those challenges succeed, since we've run out of time, I think it was in an hour 45 at the moment, uh, I said you just have to buy the book. <laughs> well, if you don't want to buy the book, here's your hour summary of what it's going to say. So I want to go through at least one or two, maybe even three of these challenges in some detail and show you the state of the literature. As we do so, I want to pick up with where I ended last time, which is there's always two questions to ask somebody who challenges something that you believe. There's what I call the oh yeah response, and there's the so what response. The oh yeah response is whether or not what's said is true. Is it really true that mental states are intimately related to brain states, for example? The so what response is, even if it is true, does it make any difference to what we here care about, which is the responsible agency of human beings, the folk psychology. So there's always going to be two questions to ask about each of these four challenges. That gives you an eight. Casper didn't like the lecture. <laughs> that gives you an eight cell box, and no surprise, there's eight chapters uh, in the second half of the book. Okay. Uh, let me start with the first challenge. If you had the libretto from yesterday, which I think Nuri brought some copies of, uh, it's basically to say we got to the end of page four, the box of the eight cells of discussion. And now I'm going to start on what I think of as box five. Namely, how's it going? with these different challenges. The challenge of reductionism, I didn't use this quote last time, so let me start with it. Francis Crick, his book called The Astonishing Hypothesis, one of the discoverers of the spiral helix, the great geneticist, says in his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, 1992, the, the astonishing hypothesis is that you and all the things you care about your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and of free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You're nothing but a pack of neurons, Crick said. Now some people find that to be an expression of skepticism. If all the things we most value, like love and creativity and being moral and decent people, is no more than the firing of two valued switches going off in the brain, the reversal in ionization potential with the calcium ions that populate the brain. That's all that's going on. That's the only equivalent. That by itself seems to make some people skeptical that we are the agents who can be both praised and blamed that we thought we were. I said last time we need to distinguish two forms of this skepticism. Uh, and actually there's more forms, but at least two. One is the reductionist. The reductionist like Crick, who says there really are things like mental states of joy and of love, emotions, and of desire, and belief, and intention. There really are such things. But they really are nothing more than a pack of neurons going off in complicated two-valued fires. That's reductionism in some sense. I distinguish that from those people who think that the brain states will take over the explanation of human behavior, not in the sense of showing that mental states like intentions that cause intentional actions are just brain states, that's reductions, but in the sense that they're not brain states and that intentions will lose out in an explanatory competition with a better science. The better science will be neuroscience. So we will replace, rather than reduce, the mental states on which responsibility is based. That is known in the trade as eliminative materialism. It's explicitly not reductionist. Now, I said that the old eliminative materialist that we knew of was B.F. Skinner. Skinner was a behaviorist, not a neuroscientist, but in his methodological behaviorism, he would eliminate the mental, not in favor of brain states. He didn't have any truck with brain states, but rather in favor of the environmental reinforcers that were the S in his stimulus response models that he could make entirely do with the behavior and the environmental stimulus 
and not worry about mental states, he would replace but not reduce them. That became known as methodological behaviorism. Mental states are too private, too secret, too non-public, too non-scientific for use in a decent science, so methodological behaviorism said get rid of it. But there's another Skinner, the Skinner that's called the logical behaviorist, who said something that looked quite inconsistent. Namely, mental states like intention are simply dispositions mm -hmm. to behavior. They're simply logical constructs. They're not causes of behavior. They are the behavior. They're the dispositions to behave in a certain way. That's a reduction, in which event he also looked like a reductionist. And as Dan Dennett said in his second book, Brainstorms, it's absolutely unfathomable how Fred Skinner could be so sloppy. How can you be both of those things? Well, let me give you the explanation, because it leads us into the nature of reduction versus eliminative materialism. Uh, and you'll see that Skinner's not as stupid as Dan said and thought it was. Um, so start out with what's called classical reductions. Classical reductions have a univocal source in Anglo-American philosophy of science discussions. It's nice when things start at a determinate point. 1961, Structure of Science, Ernst Nobel. Ernst Nobel made his fame as a writer about Google's incompleteness proof in the 1930s. He actually did teach a course at Columbia the Philosophy of Law. Uh, in 1948, philosophy of law from the point of view of a very good philosopher of science. But his fame is his book, The Structure of Science, 1961. He and Carl Hempel and maybe um, Adolf Grunbaum were the two or three leading philosophers of science in, in the entire world for decades. So classical reductionism between the sciences. Uh, Nagel's famous example was the reduction of classical thermo thermodynamics the stuff all of us learn in basic chemistry and physics about the ideal gas behavior. There's Boyle's law and Charles' law about pressure, volume, temperature, having inverse and direct relationships. Snell's law, the diffusion rate of a gas through a porous membrane with a certain constant for each porosity. You end up with solid relationships to pressure, volume, and temperature as well. So there's all those macro laws about gaseous behavior. That's classical thermodynamics. Then there's this other science at a different level, namely the science called statistical mechanics about the behavior of the molecules that make up a gas. And the reduction, as Nagel put it, was you could reduce the laws of classical thermodynamics to the laws of statistical dynamics, uh, statistical mechanics, in the sense that you can show that the macro laws, the ones being reduced, are the deductive implications of the reducing laws, the laws of the reducing science statistical mechanics. Specifically, you could show the pressure, volume, temperature, diffusion rate, etc., all the macro observable phenomena that make up the ideal gas laws are the deductive implications of simply understanding the kinetic energy of molecules that collide and create pressure, volume, and temperature uh, at a macro level. So that was his example of reduction. Now, it's more complicated than I just mentioned because notice the laws being reduced deal with pressure, volume, temperature, diffusion rate. The science doing the reduction doesn't talk about them at all. It talks about kinetic energy of molecules. To make the one laws imply the others logically, you thus need what they will call correspondence rules, what Peter Hempel called um, bridge principles. You need principles connecting the laws of the two sciences, and the simplest principles were those of identity. Identify the macro property of temperature in classical thermodynamics with the micro property of mean kinetic energy of molecules in random motion, and you will then have a bridge that allows you to make the deductive reduction of thermodynamics to statistical mechanics. That means you're actually doing two things when you reduce one science to another, like psychology, to neuroscience. You're reducing the theories and the laws, those are statements, to the theories and the laws of another science, and you're showing that the entities those theories and laws refer to have an identity relation to the things to which the theories and laws of the other science refer to. That's usually called the difference between an epistemological reduction of theories and an ontological reduction of things. And to reduce the science is to have both kinds of reduction. Now that's the classical picture of reduction. 
and minds were thought to be reduced to brains in just that way. The old Oppenheim and Putnam article of 1958, you'll find psychology reduced to neuroscience because its laws will be reduced and its enemies will be reduced. Laws will be reduced epistemologically, the enemies will be reduced uh, ontologically. That's the classic picture of reduction. The fly in the ointment is that not all reductions in science are as smooth as the ones Nagel was picturing, particularly his example about ther thermodynamics and mechanics. Um, reductions, as the literature through the 80s and the philosophy of science said, often get lumpy. Indeed, even the reduction Nagel used is a bit lumpy because it's not literally the kinetic energy of, ma of molecules that gives you temperature. It's the kinetic energy of molecules in random motion, because it isn't really the motion that's doing it, it's the collision that gives you the temperature. In which event you need to stipulate randomness, and you need to be in that probability distribution that gives you the normal collision rate with regard to random motion in order to have a good reduction base for temperature. So it's a little lumpy. Temperature equals mean kinetic energy. Um, yeah, pretty much, but it's a little lumpy. If you want to show, as you, many people did, that Newtonian mechanics is reducible to, is shown to be a special instance of, special relativity of Einstein after 1905, you need the mass that Newton was talking about to be pretty close to the mass that Einstein was talking about in order that you can have the identity relations to reduce the laws of the one to the laws of the other. They're actually a little bit different. It's lumpier yet. If you get lumpy enough, then you'll stop being a reductionist. The classic example in the philosophy of science is the 18th century French chemist, Lavoisier. You see how much fun the philosophy of is? You get to do everything. Mm -hmm. So 18th century chemistry, Lavoisier. Remember what Lavoisier was looking at with his discovery of oxygen? The chemistry that preceded him had thought that what we now call rapid oxidation, you know, fire. Um, depended upon phlogiston. That phlogiston was causally connected to fire. And they had discovered that if you have a small room and close off all the windows and such to make it airtight, the candle eventually would go out. And they explained the candle going out as there being too much phlogiston in the air. Because if you open the windows, their explanation for why you could now light the candle again was that you had, in their language, deflogistinated the air. You opened the window, the phlogiston could escape, and therefore it didn't retard the fire. Now, along comes Lavoisier um, with his notion of oxygen. And people said, well, why isn't oxygen just phlogiston? Because the reduction is too lumpy. You can't identify an oxidizing agent, oxygen, something that causes fire with phlogiston, which is something that retards fire. That's just too damn lumpy to make an identity. In which event, if you're a say, you become an illuminativist, not a reductionist, about the relation between phlogiston and oxygen. That's where the illuminative materialists are, with mental states like intention, and any brain states in the parietal cortex or anywhere else with which some people want to claim an identity. They want to say they're far too different. They're more like phlogiston and oxygen. And although it's a matter of degree, it's a matter of how lumpy is the identity claim as to whether you're a reductionist or an eliminativist, that's why Skinner's not nuts. Nonetheless, on one side or the other, eventually, if it's too lumpy, you become an eliminativist rather than a reductionist. So Skinner was entitled to say, look, it's only a matter of degree, these two different things, methodological versus logical behaviorism. But they're two different things that, for our purposes, make a good difference. Because an eliminated materialist eliminates the basis for the morality that underlies criminal law and other laws that are justice-oriented. It just eliminates it as scientifically unrespectable. It'll wither and die away, and we'll simply talk about brain states. Um, we won't talk about responsibility in terms of intentions. God knows how it's going to relate to this new vocabulary in terms of brain states. That's different than the reductionist. The reductionist is much less of a revolutionary. We still get to talk about intentions. It's just a kind of second-class citizens, because they're reducible to something more basic, namely what's going on in the brains uh, of those who have the intentions. So you need to take those two things separately. 
Now, I also said last time that reduction has become a real term of art in the philosophy of science. There aren't many people wandering around who still do Ernst Nagel style reductions, at least not of psychology, to neuroscience. So if you want the history in a thumbnail sketch, it goes like this. By the mid 80s, I think it's fair to say the consensus in the philosophy of mind and cognitive psychology was that the reduction between psychology, talking about intention, and neuroscience, talking about brain states and neuronal firing patterns, was one that came to be called non-reductive physicalism. Now, non-reductive physicalism believes the following. The relation between an intention and the closest correlate that we know of, which is certain things going on in the parietal cortex of the brain, is one of supervenience, not one of identity. A supervenience bright light at the University of Chicago has said is a word that you should choose somebody when they use it because it's so overused. But it actually has a very precise meaning despite its overuse and abuse. It means asymmetrical covariance. It came from ethics. G.E. Moore used to say moral properties supervene on natural properties. They're not identical, that's why he's a non-naturalist, but they supervene. What did he mean? He means that the supervening property, if there's any variation in that, there has to be a systematic variation, a covariance, on the property on which it supervenes. If there's a change in a moral property, there has to be a change in the natural property, but not vice versa. There can be changes in natural properties, but no changes in moral properties. Same in psychology. If there's any change in the psychological property, there has to be a brain state change, systematically covariant but not the other way around. There could be changes in brain state and no change in the psychological state. That's supervenience. It only means systematic but asymmetrical covariance. Now that begs for an explanation. You can't just stop and talk about covariance. It begs for some deeper explanation. Why would that be true? The second thesis of this kind of mind-brain relation is called the multiple realizability thesis. A mental state like intention is one brain state at one time, and another brain state at another time, and another brain state at another time, and different perhaps between different people, even within the same person, at different times. But simply, brain states multiply realize psychological states. Psychological states are, in a sense, brain states, but they're just not the same brain states. The multiple realizability thesis. Notice how that explains supervenience. Because if an intention, the psychological state, can be multiply realized by a disjunction of brain states, then you can have a change of brain state from one of these disjuncts to the other with no change of psychological state. But if there's a change in psychological state, there has to be a change in the brain states involved, is the way that it works. So it explains supervenience perfectly. It also seems to square with what we think. It doesn't look like everything's the same in the brain every time you have an intention to go downtown. It looks like there's some variation. So multiple realizability. And notice neither of those theses say what mental states are. Third thesis, mental states are essentially functionally specified states. They're states specified by their function, not by their structure. They're states that are given as intermediaries between their inputs and their outputs. Their causal roles in the explanation of human behavior is what specifies a mental state. That's to give what's called a functionalist specification of mental states, third thesis. But, fourth thesis, don't think functionalism is a kind of realm in which the mental exists. That would be a kind of dualism. Rather, each of the intentions that one has on a different occasion, although the type is not identical to the type of brain state, each token of an intention is identical to some token of a brain state, usually called the token identity thesis, which is what makes this a physicalism, but notice a non-reductive physicalism because there's no type-type identity. Now that's a long and complicated story that many people still buy. The data I presented last time about the reductions of actions to the bodily movements caused by certain goings on in the supplementary motor area, the reduction of the mental states of self-control to what's going on in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this would be an alternative interpretation what that correlation, that set of correlations, should be conceptualized as. The right way to see this is as the philosopher's interpretation of the neuroscientific gap. On this interpretation, you end up with this four-pronged thesis about how the physical data relates to the mental data.
usually called non-reductive um, uh, physical. There's a lovely book called Supervenience in Mind by uh, someone I respect a great deal, Yarkon Kim at uh, Brown University, who says, but look, there's no such thing as an ontological free lunch. There's no free lunches in the world. There's none in ontology either. If you really are a physicalist, you are in some sense a reductionist. And indeed, the scheme that I just quickly went through is reductionist in two senses. Namely, an intention is still type identical, not with any given brain state, but with a finite disjunction of brain states uh, according to the multiple realizability thesis. So there is an identity claim of the intention, not with a single brain state, but with a disjunction of possible brain states. And it's not even that large in humans. Um, it's probably a, a very finite, very small number. Secondly, it's not the case that each brain state is token identical to some other uh, intention state. It's the case that there are subtypes of intentions just think what a truly token identity would be like. That would be to say that one particular was identical to another particular, but that identity never recurred in the world. It's just metaphysically conceivable, but epistemically inaccessible, which you would never know that. You need what he called local reductions. You need the types, subtypes of intentions, the disjuncts, to themselves be types, in which you might have a reduction there too. End of the game. This is a kind of reduction as physicalism and presents the same challenge to responsibility as does old style type identity reduction that uh, Nagel and others have promoted. Now, if we move to the third generation of philosophy of science, now we're talking the first decade after 2000. And the leading books were by two extraordinary philosophers, Carl Kruger and Bill Beckley. Uh, I asked Patricia Churchland once when I was putting a conference together who I should get in philosophy. She said, by a country mile, these two guys know more neuroscience than anybody on Earth. Their two books are both books about the mechanical subsystems that underlie intelligent processing at the level of psychology. And they're fabulous. And they are basically engineering books. Uh, I went to a lecture by a structural engineer once who explained why the bridge between St. Paul, Minnesota and Minneapolis fell into the Mississippi, which it did about five years ago. It was a one-hour lecture which is a perfect example of a layered scientific explanation. He started with a picture of the bridge, which is quite dramatic, this huge bridge on the Mississippi, which pancaked into the river all at once. Uh, very, very dramatic, with lots of people, unfortunately, getting killed. Why did the bridge collapse? An hour lecture. He started with the large environmental variables, the heavy load of the construction equipment that day, the traffic vibration, the wind patterns and the fact there was a design defect in the bridge because the steel at a very crucial point was half of what it had been designed to be. On the other hand, it withstood itself for years and years. So he then went to the molecular level and explained why the tensile strength of the steel had the strength that it did, which was insufficient given the environmental variables to hold. He then went to the atomic level to explain why the molecular strength explained the tensile strength that explained why the bridge collapsed due to those environmental burdens. It was a layered set of explanations. These two books go through the subsystems within subsystems within subsystems that explain why at the macro level I get to have an intention and say what I'm saying. But there's a million different things going on in here, and they describe them at the different layers um, of intention. Now, they're usually called complementary mechanists. Uh, they call themselves non-reductionists, but notice there's nothing in this story that says you're anything but a pack of neurons. You're a pack of neurons, elegantly organized in the way an engineer would organize you, into a set of systems that together produce larger and larger outputs for larger and larger systems. And, but it's still a mechanical system. So this too, despite their saying they're not reductionist, is reductionist. And then there's lastly, there's the Young Turks in metaphysics. Um, I said, yeah, I said two days ago in my interpretive lecture, it's always fun to invent your own school. People like Kit Fine, uh, Sailor Berger at Harvard and others, they're all much younger than I am. They want to have their own metaphysics. It's called the metaphysics of grounding, a sui generis relation, such that a mental state like intention is not either type or token identical to the brain states that underlie it. It's said to be grounded in, which means constituted by these brain states, and you can't say anything further about this grounding relation. This is the new metaphysics. God bless them, hope it works. Uh, always nice to have your own school. 
But notice that too is a mechanical reductionist scheme. It's just got a different relation for reduction. It doesn't use identity, it uses this grounded relation. That's why I take all four of the current interpretations of how minds are related to brains in the philosophy of science and say, for our purposes, as different as they are between them, treat them the same. They're all the same for the purposes of the challenge they present to responsibility. They're all the same in terms of being very different than the challenge presented by limited materialists. So then the question is, OK, so what's the challenge? Why is it challenging to responsibility, to our sense of ourselves, to our agency, to all the things we value, like love and creativity, to find out that it's a bunch of two values which is going off in complicated patterns? Why at least do people think it's a challenge? Now, I don't share it, so this is a bit of speculative sociology with me. I have to put myself in the minds of those who do. It helps if you can read other people who say those things, so I went scrambling about. Here's what I found. So, there's the folks who think that the law presupposes not just that we're free, that is uncaused in our choices, but the law actually presupposes metaphysical dualism. It presupposes we have Cartesian ghosts in us who have causal efficacy. And reductionism in any of the flavors I just showed you says you don't. Now, if we presuppose that we don't have it, that would be a challenge. How do you show the law presupposes dualism? I almost wasn't even going to include this, but then the author who wrote this piece just got elevated. He was just a Brooklyn law professor, for God's sakes. It's Alex Stein, now sits on the Israel Supreme Court. So, okay, we'll give the Israelis um, some credence. So, in 2016, they published an article about, I think it's called The Law Presupposes Dualism. Um, the argument is peculiar. It is something like this. The moment the law separates, as it does, if you take a criminal law, it separates the actus reus from mens rea. It separates wrongdoing from, where's Tricio? For all those who got their PhDs in Germany, from imputation, imputato, right? It separates attribution from um, doing something wrong. It makes a separation between mental states that make you culpable, mens rea and actions that make you do wrong things, wrongdoing or act as rights. Uh, criminal law does do that in virtually every system with which I'm familiar. They want to say that shows the law is dualist because it has severed notions like intention from the actions that would allow it to be monist. That the moment you talk about intentions severed from actions, the moment you talk about intentions as opposed to intentional actions, somehow you're out of metaphysical duels. Um, the right response to this rather long article, that is the best I can do for its argument structure, is really hollow. Why would you think that? I mean, even Elizabeth Anscombe in her book on intention says sometimes the major use of intention is as an adjective or an adverb to talk about actions being done intentionally or as an action being intentional, in which event it is essentially connected to action. But she also said, we also, of course, talk about intentions as a verb. We intend to do something, but we haven't done it. We talk about intentions by themselves, the intentions with which an action is done. And she is in no sense thinking we're a dualist. If you think that intentions could be brain states, then there's nothing about dualists in saying, sometimes brain states cause other physical things, the bodily emotions we call as actions, and sometimes they don't. There's not a hint of dualism in that. So that's a conclusion waiting for an argument, namely that the law presupposes dualism. Lots of people have said it. Very few people have found an argument to support it. And I see nothing to support it. There's nothing we lawyers think that is inherently dualistic. I mean, the dualist is the person who literally thinks there's a ghost in the machine. He's like John Eccles down in Australia. The little person inside you sits at the precipice that is a vesicle, and he th that is a synaptic cleft, and he throws a, a vesicle across. That's an absurd picture, and it's one to which I think law is in no sense committed. So it's not that we're inherently dualists. So now, why else is reductionism threatening? 
is it threatening? My old teacher in philosophy of language was Paul Grice. He wrote his presidential address that said it was on ontology, basic ontology. He said, well, there are people who don't want to be seen in the company of any but the best entities. Namely, you only want first class entities in your ontology. And reduced entities are second class entities. How come? Because they're not basic. So it turns out pressure, volume, and temperature, they're really just random motion molecules that collide. Intentions are really just certain firing patterns in the parietal cortex. So the real things that exist as a matter of basic ontology are the brain things, not the mind things. They're second class citizens. But look, classic reductions are two way streets. It is true that water, as far as we can know, really is H2O, two of hydrogen bound to one of oxygen. It really is true that temperature is the mean kinetic energy of molecules in random motion such that you have collisions. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not water or temperature. They really do exist. And everything we need to ascribe responsibility based on intentions is not impeding by finding that intentions have a different nature than we thought. We might have thought that intentions were sort of psychologically autonomous. It turns out it's based on certain things going on in the brain in one of the four ways I just described. It's reducible in one of those four ways. Why would that threaten you? You just actually should be more confident. God, intentions are not just by themselves. They actually are related and supported by an entire brain science, right? I gave this lecture at Northwestern years ago, and I gave the example of Lake Michigan. And I said, look, this is the lake sitting out there. I said, look at the lake. Let me show you why there's a lake there in terms of glaciation, water table, blah, blah, blah. I said, now look again. Did the lake disappear? Lake's still there. I might have reduced it to a set of physical variables by virtue of it. It is there, but it's still there. At least it was for me. The guy that I was talking to was so insulted by my question, he got up and walked out. So his back was to the lake, so he couldn't see it. But the lake really was still there. Things that are reduced don't disappear. To explain them is not to explain them away. And it is true, brain science will in some sense be more basic on most of the models I just went through. Uh, but that doesn't make it something that does in any way impugn the less basic things such as intentions. So that shouldn't make you skeptical either. Here's what I think, third possibility, is really going on in the minds who are, of those who are troubled by Crick saying things like, you're just nothing but a pack of neurons. He's worried that the reductions that will be proposed will be what Saul Kripke, the American philosopher, who was a crowned Kripke, the greatest living philosopher of the 20th century. If there's anything you can do to give a kiss of death to a philosopher, it's to tell his, tell his fellow philosophers this guy's the greatest. Anyway, Kripke. Kripke said, look, in his book on Wittgenstein, there are what are called skeptical reductions. His example was David Hume on causation. Hume said the cement of the universe, causal relations, is really just co-occurring types of events in space and time. So he reduced causation to spatial, temporal, succession in time. It was a reductionist. Kripke, but it's a skeptical reduction. Because by saying that, Hume left out what everybody thought was essential to causation, namely necessitation, that a cause makes its effect happen. So Hume, although he's a reductionist, is a skeptical reductionist. He's someone that should make you skeptical about causation being there, because what he thought it was is what this reduction shows that it isn't. That's why Skinner's reduction was a skeptical reduction, the logical behavior of Skinner. Because when Skinner said a mental state like an intention is identical to simply a disposition to behavior, but not a cause of behavior, he was eliminating what many of us thought was essential to an intention. Namely, it's the cause of behavior that we think to be intentional. So that he eliminated something that looked really essential, in which event that looks like a skeptical reduction. Is neuroscience proposing a skeptical reduction? Well, the quote I started with from Francis Crick would indicate the answer to that might well be yes. It's bloody astonishing, Crick said, that what we phenomenologically experience in ourselves and extrapolate to the behavior of others as an intention or as love or as a creative impulse 
It's just a bunch of little switches going off in this two-value mechanism where there's a lot of them and there's a certain pattern. That's astonishing. Is it so astonishing that it makes you skeptical about the thing being reduced? I don't see why. Look, before we understood the kinetic theory of gas molecules, isn't it really astonishing that temperature, the thing that we sense by feeling hotness on our skin, temperature is a bunch of little perfectly elastic billiard balls in collision? Who would have thought? It's really surprising. But in no way does that impugn either that there's a reduction or that the reduction should make you skeptical about temperature. It's really surprising that intentions might have the nature, undoubtedly do have the nature, of certain kinds of firing patterns and certain pieces of our anatomy, probably the parietal cortex of our brain. But science is a wondrously surprising thing. All I've got to do is read some modern physics. You're surprised every time you pick up another book. It's a really surprising thing, but that doesn't make you skeptical. I see no basis for the skepticism that somehow, if you reduce minds to brains, we're going to lose the mental states on which responsibility is built. The thing that should make you skeptical is if we lose the mental states. If it's not reductionist, but a limit of this. Uh, I quote Jerry Fodor, the late um, philosopher at MIT and then eventually at Rutgers New Brunswick, who ends up saying about the limit of this, that if it were true, he said, it would be the greatest intellectual capacity that mankind could experience. Just think what you would say to yourself if you couldn't describe yourself and others' behavior in terms of the reasons for which you act, the beliefs, desires, and emotions that make you do what you do and think what you think. If you couldn't explain yourself as having a voluntary act that in fact at least sometimes causes the objects of your intentions to be realized. If none of that makes any sense, if that's all gone by the board, really hard to know how to talk, isn't it? So when Fred Skinner used to come over to my seminar at Harvard, I would say, Fred, the first volume of your autobiography is out, the particulars of my life. You're an eliminating materialist, at least when you're wearing your methodological behaviors hat. Why didn't you write the book in the austere language of stimuli and response? You talk about what you wanted, what you hoped for, what you desired, how much you loved your daughter despite putting her in a Skinner box and measures. You have all of this stuff in there in mental terms. And Fred said, well, but people wouldn't understand me if I just talked about environmental reinforcers. But I could, in fact, write the book in terms that had no mental ease in it. Um, there are articles about the church ones, the eliminative materialists of today who are neuroscientists, and they are like Skinner, they say, Paul, to Patricia, husband and wife, well, oh, Patricia, my amygdala is acting up with respect to you now. That's either to say he's emotionally attached or he wants sex, right? That's, that's the rule. Mm -hmm. But look, this is phony baloney, right? Because he's like the person who first puts it in the language he understands, mental ease. And then because of an identity claim, to what's going on into the amygdala can translate it into amygdala talk. That's not eliminative materialism, that's reductionism. So when they play this game, they're just playing the reductionist game. They have some famous stuff where they try to do what I challenge Skinner to do, translate all the ordinary talk into neuroscience talk. And of course, if you've got identities, you can do that, but that's not um, an eliminative materialism. Is eliminated materialism true? It's a possible scientific hypothesis. If it were true, it would be the disaster that the voter presents, not just for criminal law and responsibility, but for our entire self-conception. But is it true? Dan Dennett and I were trying to put a conference together on line brain metaphysics a few years ago. We couldn't find a single contemporary philosopher to come to defend eliminated materialism. It's a speculative project by now just the churchlands alone. We invited Patricia, and then we invited Paul, and neither of them wanted to show up either. Um, it's a speculative project of a, of a sort that has never been realized. It's possible, but there's not any evidence for it. The evidence is all the other ways. Neuroscience progresses, we're getting better and better at finding the nature of various things like the self-control mechanisms that allow you to, in fact, control your impulses and so forth. So if it were true, second question, would it matter? Yeah, it would matter a lot. But is it true? No evidence that it's true, just some speculation by a couple of professors that are now emeritus chattering their neuroscience chat on San Diego. So that's the reductionist challenge. 
Um, let me do another challenge, if that's okay. I don't know how much your patience is. If it's, um, if it's not good, your feet are a perfectly good response. But let me just do a, a second challenge, which is the determinist challenge. How's that going to go? Now, determinism is usually thought to be one of the implications of reductionism, because physical systems at the macro level are deterministic systems. So if the mind is the brain, then the mental states will be determined, um, because the brain states that they are are clearly determined being physical states. So determinism really is um, a variable, um, of an implication of reductionism. I separate the two because you can be a determinist and not be a reductionist. The bases for skepticism are different. Determinism is an older skepticism than reductionism. And it proceeds from a different basis. It doesn't worry that we're nothing but a pack of neurons. It doesn't worry about identity or grounding. It worries about causation. It worries that our choices, whatever they are, even if they're dualistic states, our choices are caused by factors we don't choose. And that should make us non-responsible. Neuroscience is hardly the first to raise the determinist challenge to responsibility. It's been around in centuries. In modern form, it really descends from Hobbesian materialism. Anyone since Hobbes who thinks materialistic processes determine everything in the world will think that about human choice, and that makes it look like if causation is sufficient, we simply couldn't have chosen uh, other than we did the determinist challenge. So I separate the two challenges. Uh, if any of you came to my wife's talk this morning, you'll notice that part of the reason our marriage works is we get to write each other all the time. So I gave a talk at the Penn Center for Neuroscience and Society um, just based on the separation between reductionism and determinism. She doesn't buy the distinction. She thinks the two are too closely allied to be separated. We had coffee in the morning, and then I went to go give this talk. I got up to the dais, and I saw that I had a text message from Heidi Hurd, my wife, who said something like this. Um, uh, ah, wrong quote. So I didn't marry George Fletcher. That quote was from George. <laughs> <laughs> George and I are good friends. We're not that good friends. We're not that good friends together. Um, so she wrote me this text that said, when I got up there and people raised the questions that she had raised about how you separate the determinist challenge from the reductionist challenge, she says, I quote from her text, just say there are, emphasize are, there are two different debates here about two, emphasize two, different things that presently standardly conflict. Say it very loudly and repetitively with that impatient, slightly disdainful tone in your voice that you always get when you are on actual philosophical thin ice. And people will be sure they're the idiots when they can't see why there's any distinctions. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I read that to the audience saying, okay, it looks like I have to convince you better than I convinced her over coffee this morning. <laughs> but the relations are different. The reductionist challenge is based on identity or ground. The determinist challenge is based on causation. You can be challenged by determinism even if you're not a reductionist. It is true if you're a reductionist, you will be a determinist as well. And one of the challenges then that will come out of physicalism will be determinism. But that doesn't mean we can't separate the challenge. So it's been around, as I said, for a long time as a separate challenge arises, not of course just from neuroscience, from virtually every science of human behavior that has its causal story about human choice. So if you were a Freudian, you talked to some people did yesterday at DUC about Freudian instinct theory and the drive theory and how that causes behavior. If you're a geneticist, you talk about genetic determinism. If you're a behaviorist, you talk about the environmental determinants uh, of choice. Um, there's actually no limit. Any causal story uh, looks like it's equally challenging because what causes one to be skeptical is causation, sufficient causation of choice, irrespective of whether the causing is from dynamic psychiatry, ethology, uh, genetics, behaviorism, or neuroscience. What's different about neuroscience is that it's captured the popular imagination. 
because it is, as Josh Green at Harvard says, the bottleneck for all remote causes. The environment, genetics, all other causes have to operate if they're going to affect how you choose through the brain, which means they will have their effects with the brain, but those effects will be the immediate causes of choice. So it has made people more skeptical than genetics or behaviorism or ethology or any of the other determinism, psychic determinism from Freud ever could. The challenge really is the same. How do you rebut the challenge? Well, I wrote a long article called Compatibilisms for Neuroscientists to see if I couldn't convince them there was a literature to which they needed to pay attention. Because most philosophers, most metaphysicians, don't think determinism challenges responsibility. There's, of course, some outliers, and philosophers never universally agree on anything. But there's a pretty good consensus that determinism does not challenge responsibility. Why do they think that? Well, the alternative to thinking choices are determined is usually called libertarianism. Libertarianism, not in the political sense, where you're reading too much John Locke for your own good, but rather libertarianism in the metaphysical sense. That when you say there has to be a free will, you mean literally a will that is uncaused in its causing of action. So you need an uncaused will, is what a libertarian believes, but fortunately the libertarian says, we have one. We are free. Um, it's almost hard to argue against a position that I find so counterintuitive, but just think about it for a moment. What does the libertarian metaphysician think? She thinks that we're all gods because what? The Big Bang and Aquinas' prima causa, God, are the only plausible candidates in the universe we know for uncaused events. But if you add up human choice, then I guess we're all little gods in all the choices that we make. I know some religions want to say that. What an extraordinarily narcissistic point of view. You think we're actually free of the sea of causation and nothing else is? What an incredible arrogance to think such a thing, as my wife would say this morning. Human beings aren't that great. They're not, we're not that important. We're not that different than the rest of nature. Beyond that, there's this point. Dan Dennett, in one of his books, has a Casper cartoon that he cut out, Casper the Ghost. It, the frames go something like this. Somebody throws a brick at Casper. Casper's a ghost. Brick goes right through him. Can't hurt Casper. But it pisses Casper off that somebody tried to hurt him with a brick. So he picks up the brick and throws it back and hurts the person who threw it. Dennett, can you explain the physics how that works? The brick goes through Casper, but Casper can pick it up and send it physically through the air. How does that work? How can you be a causer of physical things and yet be uncaused, untouched by physical things? What an asymmetric physics you must have with regard to what affects you and what you can affect. That's a rather incredible story. And then there's this point. Suppose it turns out we were uncaused. So an old friend of mine, a colleague, University of Texas, Bob King, we do our seminars together um, off and on. I go to his, he goes to mine. He has written probably the most famous book, Defending Libertarianism, from a scientific point of view. That is, he's not a crazy dualist that thinks there's literally ghosts and machines. He rather thinks if you're going to show libertarianism is to be true, it's an inference from the best science we can muster. So his book, The Significance of Free Will, late 1990s, makes the following argument. Most of our choices are fully determined, he says. The daily choices are fully determined. It's too obvious that they are to deny. But we do have what he calls self-forming willings. At certain points in our lives, we decide we want to be a different person than we are. And those self-forming willings are free in the libertarian sense. Now, how do you show they're free? Well, you have to do some brain science. And what he wants to say is they're free because we do know that there are non-determined events at the quantum level. Now, the stuff that goes on in the brain is far too macro to be quantum indeterminate. That he understands. But he says, isn't it possible that, say, intentions are formed in the parietal cortex with certain kinds of interactions, certain kinds of vesicles crossing, certain kinds of synaptic clefts? Isn't it possible that the crossing of those vesicles, although that's way too large an event for quantum indeterminacy, is nonetheless the effect 
of a much more micro-quantum indeterminacy that the brain has naturally amplified into a macro-indeterminacy. We know there are such amplifiers, we build them. That's the old um, saw about Schrodinger's cat. You can attach macro things to micro events, like quantum events, quantum indeterminist events, and the macro will be no determined than the micro. So there are amplifiers. Isn't it possible, Kane says, that the brain has amplifiers of quantum indeterminacy? The answer is yes, of course it's possible. We've shown how it can be done um, by our own inventions. But there's not a scintilla of elements that there actually are naturally occurring amplifiers in the human brain that amplify quantum indeterminacy to the macro level you need to be talking about vesicles being indeterministic in their center across the clefts. Not a scintilla of evidence. The only reason Bob wants it to, uh, says it's true is because he so desperately wants it to be true. He wants there to be this little bit of freedom. Okay? But as I always say in his class, I used to get that, but I've never gotten him. What if he gets that? Is that a freedom, as Hume would say, that's worth wanting? Suppose you get a randomness at the macro level that matches the randomness of quantum indeterminacy for electrons, quarks, etc. Is that in any way adding to the freedom that makes you a responsible person? Isn't randomness of choice just as much the enemy of responsibility as determination of choice? What makes you Responsible doesn't seem to be either randomness or causation. They seem equally prima facie the enemy of responsible choice. It isn't that it's random gives you more options. That it's random simply means it's arbitrary. And that looks like the opposite of what you'd want for responsibility. So even if you have, which we have no evidence that it exists, quantum indeterminacies at the macro level for vesicles, it's not a freedom, as you would have said, that anyone wants. Who wants that kind of freedom? It doesn't look like it does you any good. So I try to put aside in one chapter libertarianism. It's a non-starting um, metaphysics, I think. Uh, and then you say to yourself, okay, if libertarianism is false, then determinism is true. In the sense that, take modern physics into account, human choice is as determined as any other macro-sized event which means at the quantum level it's indeterminate, but by the time you cancel the probabilities to go to the macro level, it's as determined as any other event. That looks like, therefore, determinism in the relevant sense is true. But remember, there's two questions. One is, is it true? The other question is, does it matter if it's true? And that's where compatibilism comes, comes in. The philosophical consensus called compatibilism is, even if determinism is true about human choice, which it probably is, um, so what? We never thought responsibility depended on being free in that contracausal sense. Of course you have to be free of having people put gun at your heads and threaten you. That's the excuse of duress. You have to be free of the known excuses like compulsion. But you don't have to be free of causation. There's nothing that requires that. Indeed, we can show you that it's not required. How do you do that? Well, there's two kinds of compatibilists, if you really get into the literature of free will of the last 50 years. Um, they both deal with the problem. Is a person whose choice is fully determined by factors she herself didn't choose, is that person capable of being responsible because, in some sense, they couldn't have chosen other than they did? Their choice was sufficiently caused, therefore they couldn't have chosen other than they did. The principle of alternative possibilities looks like a plausible principle of responsibility. To be responsible means you must have the ability to have chosen other than, in fact, you did on a given occasion. Determinism might look like it makes that impossible. Two sorts of answers given by compatibilists. Most people who call themselves compatibilists in philosophy are what are called source compatibilists. John Martin Fisher, um, and a whole, whole host of others. A source compatibilist says you're responsible if your choice is itself the right kind of source for the thing that you do. And you don't have to have had the ability to have chosen otherwise to be responsible. This starts in 1969 with a famous article by Harry Frankfurt, where he said, look, imagine a case in which there's this evil guy calling Mr. Black. This is 
what he calls me. Mr. Black sits here, and with Judy Allen, he's going to make a decision. Mr. Black wants him to make one decision rather than another. Now, I'm a good neuroscientist, so I put a little thing right in his head. It does two things. It reads what he's going to decide. It's like what's done in Berlin these days. And he's making the wrong decision and change it so he'll decide the way I want him to. So Mr. Black puts the device in Giuliano's head. Giuliano makes the decision, but he's a good guy. He never makes the wrong choice. So Mr. Black never has to push the button that actually changes what he chooses. Is he responsible for his choice, either praiseworthy of good, blameworthy of bad? Frankfurt intends, the source compatibilists intend, that you think he's responsible. He chose it, and he did what he did because he chose it. No one interfered with his choice. It is true, unbeknownst to him, he couldn't have chosen other than he did, but that is how he chose, and he did what he did because he chose it. Thus the name, source compatibilism. You don't have to have the ability to do other than you, you did in order to be responsible. That's not me. I'm with the old guys, starting with G.E. Moore in 1912, called the classical compatibilists. We think you actually do need the ability to do other than you did in order to be responsible. But as I was saying yesterday, it all depends on what you mean by the word ability. Because ability is used in English, Portuguese, any natural language I've ever seen. Ability doesn't mean free of causation. The example I used yesterday was the track coach, but let me use a different one. That structural engineer that I listened to is the why the bridge collapsed between Minneapolis and St. Paul went through six layers of sufficient conditions as to why that bridge fell. He gave us causation in layers, lots of it. And then he said at the end of the lecture, you know, the bridge could have held. I mean, it had the ability to hold. What on earth did he mean? He meant in a possible world very close to the actual world, namely just a small difference in the wind patterns or on the construction load, and the vibration is set up by the two together, it would have held. He meant it had the ability, not in the sense that in the actual world it wasn't sufficiently caused to fall, it was, but rather in a very close possible world, one that slightly changed from the actual world, it would have held. And that's what we seem to mean by ability in almost all of its uses. So when you say, as I had this track coach yesterday, saying to his track star who lost a race, you could have won the race. He does not mean, this coach, there were not conditions sufficient for you to lose it. He rather means you would have won it had you tried harder, lengthened your stride like I told you, not gone out with your girlfriend the night before and got so damn tired, or lost your focus, or any of the other things that sufficiently caused him to lose. If those had been different, you would have won. That's not incompatible with causation. In which event you want to say, as a compatibilist of this stripe, yeah, you could have done otherwise. In a possible world very close to this one, had you really wanted, for example, not to do it enough, you wouldn't have done it. And that means you had the ability not to do it. That's all we mean by ability. We don't mean that you're not sufficiently caused. That's usually called classical compatibilism. Now, the article that I cited online is so long because there's 50 years of philosophical discussion about exactly how this works. Um, I, Michael Smith at Princeton, Connery Rebellion at um, USC, and a bunch of others are what are called the New Conditionalists. We've written articles like the one I'm citing that has 10 amendments to this vast literature criticizing this view. Um, I won't bore you with the details. We do think we're right. You can revive the view. It makes perfectly good sense. That's called classical compatibilism. Now, that's two good roots, either source compatibilism or classical compatibilism, to say it doesn't matter that human choice is caused by factors themselves unchosen. We're still responsible anyway. Neuroscience, therefore, does not present any danger. There's one last thing that you want to do to show that this is true. Uh, it's the thing that's raised by Tom Nagel in various of his works, where he says, the threat from determinism arises from responsibility because the established excuses that we have are all instances of a more general principle that if choice is caused by sufficient factors themselves unchosen, you're not responsible. 
so that the excuses we have belie any kind of compatibilism, either source or uh, conditionalist or classical compatibilism. But that needs an answer. The answer I've given is a long article called Causation and the Excuses. The reason the article is long is because it's also boring. What you have to do is go through all the excuses of morality in the criminal law and show that they're not based on causation of choice. Without doing that, let me just give you one example. Most legal systems and morality that underlies them will give people excuses if they do things that are bad, that they would not have done had they not been drunk, and, and it's important that it's and, and if getting drunk is not their fault, called the defense of involuntary intoxication. So if somebody slips something into your drink through no fault of your own, you get into a state of intoxication. And you do something intoxicated you not, would not have done sober. That raises the possibility of there being an excuse called involuntary intoxication. Now notice that looks like it fits really well with Nagel's thesis. Namely, if you're caused to do something by a condition that itself was caused by something you didn't initiate, then your choices were caused and you're not responsible. That has suckered a number of people in. So Lord Macaulay, who wrote the Penal Code of India in the 19th century, proposed before the parliament overruled him that there be exactly such a defense. But what most people pointed out to Lord Macaulay in the 19th century was that that's not an excuse. That's not an excuse that it's not your fault that you're drunk and you did something you wouldn't have done had you not been drunk. You need something more than simply causation. You need incapacitation. And what you look at when you see legal systems from Germany, the United States, and elsewhere, involuntary intoxication requires more than causation. It requires drunkenness to the point of incapacitation. In Anglo-American systems, incapacitation to the point that if you were sober, you would be judged legally insane. You have to be, as they say in popular idiom, out of your mind drunk to get a, an excuse of involuntary intoxication. How come? Because simply being caused to choose in a certain way is not to be excused. You need to be incapacitated from choosing otherwise. Then you could say you could not choose otherwise. Being caused does not make you not able to choose otherwise. Um, I don't know if you've tested this. There was a famous criminal law professor in Virginia uh, who I used to joke had written an article about intoxication and had spent his entire life doing first-person experiments on the effects of alcohol on the brain. The guy drank like a fish his entire life. Um, but you should trust him. Um, he wanted to say, you know, you actually don't lose control of your choices until just about when you pass out. If you perform, you're not excused, and if you're excused, you couldn't perform. That's kind of the way he put it with regard to rape. Um, so that it really requires incapacitation, causation is not enough. Anyway, do that for each of the excuses. And then you can say to the Tom Nagels of the world, there are no beachheads here for causation being an excuse. The established excuses we have rely on incapacitation in the sense of incapacitation I mentioned before, an ability measured by what you would do in very close possible worlds that you don't need to specify. In any event, that completes one's sense that there's no challenge coming out of simple um, causation of behavior. So James Q. Wilson came to our neuroscience group um, from Los Angeles to give us an example. It's a famous example. See, see if it tests your sense about incompatibilism. It's the example I used yesterday, but I'm going to give you a different piece of it to test your intuitions. This is the example of a school teacher in Virginia who, at age 40, with no prior history of any sexual misadventures, starts doing inappropriate sexual touching of his 14-year-old prepubescent stepdaughter and is hauled before the judge for sexual assault, is found to have had a pre, uh, to have had a right uh, orbital frontal tumor. That, I'll just shortcut the details, seems to have caused his sexual desires. Because when the tumor was removed, the desires were removed, and without the desires, of course, he didn't have touch it. Three years later, he was back in court for the same problem, inappropriate sexual touching of you know, young people. The tumor had reappeared, they took away the tumor, the behavior went away, and the desires went away. Wilson. So, so far have I told you a story 
that makes you want to excuse this um, teacher. His desires, let's give the neurologists their due, as they say in the archives of neurology, 2003, his desires were caused by the tumor. Let's just assume that's a scientific fact. The tumor, for which of course he made no choice, the tumor, a factor not chosen, caused him to have the desires that he did. Because of the desires that he had, of course, he made the choices that he did to touch the girls. Is he not responsible? Some people want to have the temptation to say, yes, but think about it for a minute. We all have tumors. Every one of us. They're not little round things in our head like a right orbital or frontal tumor, but they're goings on in the brain that we didn't choose. They're the physical things that give us the desires that we have. We don't choose most of our desires. We reflect upon them on January 1. We try to make some resolutions about them. Don't keep them very long. We basically have desires come from where we know not. They arise within us more than we choose them. And yet, if we have those desires, aren't we responsible for making bad choices to execute them? I know the Bible goes the other way when it says the wish for the woman in adultery is as bad as the deed. Rubbish, right? No, it isn't. If you choose not to act on the wish, you get credit for that. As opposed to erratically, as my wife would have said this morning, of course the wish shows you've got some bad dispositions. But it doesn't deontically show that you're liable to blame because you restrained yourself. You didn't act on it. It's the choice to act on the wish that makes you blameworthy. And the fact that the wish was caused by factors themselves unchosen, whether it's a tumor, or whether it's certain environmental reinforcers, daddy always did this, or whether it's certain genetic makeups and predispositions and extra Y chromosome, whatever those causes might be, they gave you the desires that you have, but the desires are what you chose upon. So Wilson and myself is a compatibilist. Compatibilism is the doctrine. You're responsible for your choices on the desires that you have. You are not responsible because you chose your desires, because most of us don't for most of our desires. The fact that a tumor caused them is neither here nor there. Now, why do people have the intuition that that doctor should nonetheless get an excuse? That's because there's more to the story, the part that I gave yesterday, than just that his desires were caused by the tumor. There's more to the story, and there's two pieces more that are particularly relevant. What we say about the, doc the, the teacher is when you gave him a real reason not to touch women. He still did it. Now Kant in the second critique says if you want to test whether someone could have done otherwise, he said, and he used the example of lust, he said if a guy has lustful desires, I said, I just can't help myself, I gotta yield to them. He says, here's the way you test it. You put an executioner across the street that he can see, and if he touches inappropriately a female, you execute him right then and there. Now let's see if he touches it. Give him very good reason to want not to touch and see if he touches anyway. If he does, then he really couldn't have done otherwise. The behavioral test about ability. So give that teacher really good reason not to touch females. Well, we did. If he touched the females, he would get thrown out of the rehab program he was in. He would go to jail, he would lose his job, and his marriage would go to hell. He had as good a reason as he could have to not touch, and he still grabbed every nurse in sight in the rehab program, in which he had good behavioral evidence that he could not have done other than he did, in the relevant, not that causal sense. Secondly, the neurologist discovered, before Caltech discovered its relevance later on, that his dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was vastly distended by the right orbital frontal tumor, and it turns out from 2009 on, we understand the prefrontal cortex dorsolaterals really are where you mediate the gluttonous control, the gluttonous impulses coming out of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex headed to the supplementary motor area and to motor action. He didn't have the equipment to control himself. Not only do we have the behavioral evidence, we have the neuroscientific evidence that this man didn't have functioning equipment that would allow him to control those impulses. Now we've got a pretty good excuse, but it's not because he was caused. It's rather because he was incapacitated 
the Kant test, the kind of factual test of probability. And we can verify that even with the neuroscience we now know about his dorsolateral brief. Now you might say the excuse. But notice it's not determinism that gives him the excuse. It's not the fact that his desires were caused by factors themselves unchosen. It's rather because his choice itself was made under conditions where in the relevant sense he couldn't have done otherwise. So maybe you give him an excuse. That's to give nothing to determinism challenging responsibility uh, in general. Well, that's the second challenge. Um, it's 20 to 6. Uh, the epiphenomenal challenge is actually the most complicated of them. It's also, I think, the most interesting. Um, but I probably taxed your patience uh, enough at uh, what we're running at, about an hour 20. So maybe I should stop there. As I said yesterday, by the time I get through of all four of the challenges, of which I've only done the first two, the conclusion of the book is benign. Probably banal too, but it's at least benign. Namely, we're okay. The criminal law doesn't have to be abolished, the way the neuroscientists have been saying. The morality on which it's based is just fine. We get to think of ourselves in the terms of the folk psychology for the indefinite future. Nothing in neuroscience is gonna challenge any of those three things. However, that doesn't mean those of us interested in neuroscience should stop paying attention. It has lots of interesting particular things to say about questions the law cares about. It really matters that we discovered at Caltech the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is needed to restrain your impulses, because now if we get structural damage there, we've got something to say that's legally relevant. It really matters that the dopamine signal from opioid drugs has a really peculiar effect on the pleasure centers of the brain, in which event we've got something of relevance when we raise the issue about whether addiction is an excuse. Neuroscience gives us very good particular data on particular issues. What it doesn't do is challenge us across the front. It doesn't do what my old friend Mike Zaniga, who runs the Center for the Study of Human Mind, nice title, Center for the Study of Human Mind, University of California, Santa Barbara, used to say. He used to say, you know, we're going to own you. The we being neuroscientists, the you being lawyers. No, you're not. We're going to do just fine. Anyway, thank you for your attention. sense doesn't become eligible for a kind of excuse. 
So that the simple fact that there are environmental causes is no more relevant than the fact that there are tumors. Behavior is caused. It's caused by genetics, it's caused by the environment, and it's caused by the product of both of those in terms of brain states. That shouldn't by itself impact our responsibility assessments. I think what gets confused is, you know, a decent human being has more concerns besides simply punishing people who are responsible. Because if you're a decent human being, you also should care about preventing crime to start with. And if you're in the prevention business, understanding its causes is the first thing you need. How do you prevent crime, get better income distribution, better education, and get in control of your drug and alcohol problem? Um, that's a worthwhile sort of preventative strategy. It may also be the case that sometimes we liberals feel guilty we haven't done enough. In which event it doesn't affect the desert of such people for punishment, it affects our sense we have the right to give it to them. Because as a failure of distributive justice, we might think we haven't made the society fair enough for them that because of our failure, they're making culpable choices. They're still culpable choices. It isn't that they don't deserve it, but maybe we lose some of our right to give it to them. We have that impulse as well. So we have all of those reactions, but none of them touch the basic issue of the responsibility. Environmental causes are surely no stronger than genetic causes that are um, brain causes. Even if you make them either by themselves or together sufficient, the argument I just gave for compatibilism is, so what? Well, uh, Michael, just uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, well, we were discussing uh, two days ago the, the issue of the self-driving cars, and I was wondering what would be the, the utility of this all this discussion of neuroscience and discussing patterns of how how we decide in, in, in framing the artificial uh, intelligence patterns on how to decide. I want, uh, I'd like to know what would be the, the utility for, for for this this area. Of search, and the second point is, I know I know very little uh, about neuroscience, neuroscience, and and in all this area. But one of the books I, I read is, is one by Peter Hacker, and I was wondering, uh, I'd like to know what's your opinion about Peter Hacker's uh, discussion and views on, on this issue. Yeah, I love the uh, self-driving cars. I tried to make a criminal law exam two years ago on the Google okay. cars because it's, it's so interesting. Um, I don't think neuroscience has anything in particular to um, contribute to that. The Google cars, if you get them right, can program, they can take all those thought experiments that philosophers have done with trolleys and all these other scenarios where you have to make choices, do you turn the trolley that's going to run over five and then it runs over one, for example. And I gather it's engineeringly possible to program a Google car so that it's got different views on social responsibility. So you could have the car that says, never sacrifice me for anybody else. So if there's two people in the road and the only alternative to save them is to go off a cliff, keep that car running over You buy that program. Um, you could buy the altruist car. The altruist car that sees two on the road, the only chance to go through it takes you over the cliff. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be more expensive or less, but I bet nobody buys it. But that's a really interesting issue about programming. But notice you might have criminal responsibility of the person who buys the car, not because of the choice made at the time of driving, because of course the car is making that choice, so they're not choosing it. On the other hand, that, that car becomes like the the spring guns of old. You've made a choice at an earlier time that chooses how the car is going to choose, in which event you became liable for the car. The car is not an intervening cause. You, in fact, approximately cause the harm the car causes. So you're going to be responsible and blameable because if you chose that program, you intentionally chose just that scenario. So it's not going to impact your responsibility. 
And they, I think people who really care about artificial intelligence, like Giuliano, if you make those cars smart enough, then maybe you can hold the car responsible. I mean, you don't want to be a carbonist about this just because the Google cars have their intelligence realized in silicone rather than carbon. Doesn't mean, as Kant said, if they have the attributes of a rational and moral agent, they have the blame of one. They could, if you made them smart enough, in principle, become blameable themselves. And then they might actually become intervening causes, which would be interesting. But that's a long ways in the future. Uh, Peter Hacker, as you undoubtedly know, has a book with Bennett on neuroscience. And then there's another book by Dennis Patterson and uh, Michael Pardo that's basically a, a, a Patterson book applied to the law. The problem with all four of those people is that they read way too much Wittgenstein for their own good. They are holdovers from a kind of conceptual analysis that was the ordinary language program from the later Wittgenstein and from Weil in the 50s and 60s at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, they therefore think there are what Weil called category mistakes, which I call bad armchair science. Because they think just by looking at patterns of usage, you can extract categorical differences by virtue of which you can either validate or write off certain kinds of scientific um, hypotheses. So it's an extraordinary. So one of Wittgenstein's students, Norman Malcolm, wrote a book called Dreaming in 1959, um, where he had the same influence. And he said, look, dreaming we have a particular way of knowing. It's waking remembrance. Waking remembrance of an image that you know is not true. That's dreaming. And then we had the psychologists of the 50s, Demon and Clayton, who found that actually, of course, in dreaming, two things go on. You have rapid eye movement, and you have certain brainwave patterns that EEGs of the time could pick up. So you have both electrical activity patterns and behavioral eye patterns measuring dreaming. If you have this view that language can fix the meaning so that science can be judged by how well it fits that pre-existing meaning, you'll say exactly what Norman Malcolm said he thought on behalf of Wittgenstein. Namely, you're not talking about dreaming, you're talking about something else. Because dreaming is fixed by waking remembrance. That's its category of discourse. You can't add some sort of new correlation to behavior or to brains without talking about something else. That just runs counter to the way in which everybody, since Putnam and Kripke, think we use language. We use language like dreaming or mental states like intention in a way that's open-ended to further discoveries by science about the true nature of the thing to which reference is made. You can find out more about dreaming. It doesn't make nonsense to say that there are some dreams that are not remembered. What do we mean by that? We mean there's a dream that actually is experienced, potentially subject to recall, but is not remembered, that has a certain brain function and certain behavioral manifestations. It makes perfectly good sense to talk about unremembered dreams, despite the supposed conceptual tie of dreaming to waking remembrances. So the problem for Hacker is the problem with Ryle and Wittgenstein. It's the problem that says, from simply looking at language, you can discern categorical differences from which you can therefore debar people from making contingent scientific identity claims. So my old example is to use Frege's example against the Royal Wittgenstein hackers of the world. Before the Babylonian astronomers discovered that the evening star and the morning star were actually one and the same thing, namely the planet Venus, you could imagine the Babylonian astronomer who first made this hypothesis coming to Ryle, Wittgenstein, and Hacker and saying, you know, the evening star really is the morning star because so it's one of the same thing, Venus. And you could imagine the ordinary language philosopher drawing himself up and saying, it can't be. Because the evening star occurs in that category of discourse called evening talk. That's where you're having cocktails. The morning star appears in that category of discourse called morning talk. That's when you're having breakfast cereal and milk. And these are different categories of speech. And therefore, these occur in different categories. They can't be the same because of what Ryle called the category difference mistake. You can't take something in one category 
and put it over here. And that's what Hacker thinks and Patterson, etc., about brain talk and mind talk. Mind talk is a certain category, brain talk is a certain category. You can't say that things talked about are identical to each other because these are different categories of existence. As Ryle used to say, the word existence means something different. When it's used to predicate about, talk about mental properties and when it's talk about physical properties, which is why it's nonsense to make an identity claim between them. Um, that's all surely false. Science is not limited by philosophers sitting in armchairs and making category inferences for patterns of usage. Fortunately for us, it's open-ended in the way that we use words to continue scientific discovery. That's a long answer. So, Hacker's book, um, unfortunately, because he's a smart guy, but it's, it's an ordinary language book. It's dated, even though it was written in the 90s, should have been written in the 60s. Actually, I want to have many questions. Uh, I think I'm thinking about many things, and I, um, probably I won't articulate it in a, in a very concise way. Um, but I, I've been thinking uh, on, on some ideas which will be related to to artificial intelligence, and I would use an example of self-driving uh, uh, cars. But I think that the interesting thing here, when we compare this perspective on neuroscience and artificial intelligence, is that basically we are following uh, different uh, directions, but dealing with the same problem, because uh, we both depart from uh, the idea, from this folk psychology and this uh, Cartesian conception, Cartesian Kantian conception of, of mental states which uh, cause actions, and the modern law has been developed on this conception and it's all based on some macro level of explanation of uh, human behavior. And then what, what happens now is that from this macro level, neuroscience starts showing that there are many physical processes which are which can be uh, revealed in different levels, levels of uh, explanation. And then we may, you, uh, you, you may find out that many things that you attribute as a desire, you can check that actually there are other factors causing this desire. And so you depart from the macro level and then you go to lower levels and more detailed levels of explanation and then we start wondering whether those mental states and those uh, legal criteria to recognize or attribute mental states mental states does really make sense. This is the, the example of the tumor or should a legal conclusion ch change to the fact that now that we know that some of our desires is, are caused and then we have different positions around it. You have uh, um, a particular uh, compatibilist uh, position, but it's interesting that we depart from a conviction based on some, you know, on one level of scientific knowledge or folk psychology, and then we start to discover the working of this organic mach machine. In artificial intelligence, it's the other way around. We start from an exp a physical explanation of a machine that comes to another level of explanation, which is the level of design, the software or the program that commands the 
on their machine. But then this design gets so complex that we have to reach a macro level of explanation and we handle a computer or a software better if, if we depart from the macro, macro level explanation, for instance. Kasparov playing play chess with, with um, um, Deep Blue. Uh, he cannot make any move by trying to guess what are the electric circuits that are going on or what are the, uh, the many uh, previous games that uh, Deep Blue classifies before he, he makes a choice. So he attributes intentions. He moves the rook because he wants to close uh, some uh, of, of, of a possible following move. So then, after that, we start departing from micro levels, physical level, design level, we start thinking about attributing mental levels to mental states, to machines, to uh, physical uh, plastic or um, circuit machines, because we would not be able to act before them properly if not by attributing mental states. And then that's why now there is the discussion, well, since we are now attributing mental states to machines, uh, is it not the case to recognize that they are persons? And then there is all this, uh, all this uh, discussion. Um, the thing is, um, We have a, a, in, in this in this idea. If we if we recognize person here, it's it's more difficult to. I, I, I have to think better about it. But I would like to think whether compatibilist idea in this when you when, when you come from from the bottom to to macro level is uh, is so uh, attractive when in the case of a machine, when you are dealing with a case where you depart from the macro level to lower levels of explanation. And because of the questions with the machines are, well, should we recognize personality to machines or should we create another form of law to deal with machines? And your question is similar. Should we bother? with our discoveries about the workings on the lower levels of explanation. So everything, everything was to the, to, to, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm tiring or bothering you, but. You're not bothering me. Uh, let me just say what allies artificial intelligence should be with neuroscience. Um, look, we both have top down and top bottom up approaches. And the fact that you might start at one rather than the other, and the discipline is neither here nor there. We all start with top down, which in case of brains means the phenomenology and behavior of human beings, and at the bottom is the equipment with which you're working, your neural environment. You start at the top with the macro behavior of machines and the mental states that you're attempting to attribute to them, at least metaphorically, and the bottom, of course, is the machine structure. So it's like building the railroad in America across uh, the continent. It started in California and Nebraska at the same time. Top down and bottom up is just a strategy of approaching, a discovery device, a heuristic. The tracks need to meet in the middle, however you do it. Now, why are these two top down, bottom up, meet in the middle enterprises so friendly? Because you model in silicone what we deal with in carbon. And if you can, in silicone, in fact, and get really good chest play programs, for example, that shows you what must be going on in carbon in Casper's head, or at least it suggests what's possible for going on. Good models, sorry, uh, good models of how you uh, actually operate in, in uh, intelligent ways for humans can come from artificial intelligence. It could be really different. The fact that you do find it useful to attribute mental states to machines shouldn't be confused with the question of whether they really have them. So last night at dinner we were asking how and when would you know if a machine was conscious? 
if you like bad films, remember the Terminator film series, when they finally connect up the computers of the Earth, they have a particular moment in time when they become conscious, they say. They reach consciousness, and that's when the machines decide to destroy humanity. What are those guys picturing when they picture machines becoming conscious is a really interesting question. But one for which I think there's an answer. What is it for a, a switching mechanism, which is a digital computer and a brain, to actually have the property of consciousness? Um, but the fact that it's useful to attribute strategies to machines isn't the same question as to whether they really have consciousness or intention, or beliefs, or desires. Which, of course, means for responsibility purposes that it's a useful heuristic in dealing with the computer not to worry about the computer mechanism. If you're playing chess with it, you better treat it like a really smart chess player and what he intends, because that's the way to win. So that's a good heuristic, but it doesn't mean really that machine has intentions. You do, don't want to be a species and you don't want to be a carbonist. As Kant said, if there are Martians, no matter what their structure, if they are rational agents in the way that makes them moral agents, then you have to treat them as such. And the same will be true of machines, that their silicon should be neither here nor there, if indeed they have the essential attributes of first thing. But it's no argument that they have them, that it's useful so to treat them, because we know that we do better in treating them if you're playing chess that way than uh, as a machine. It used to be, I don't know if it's still true about computers, they moved so far, it used to be said that to play chess algorithmically is impossible for even the fastest computers before the heat death of the universe, because there's too many possibilities for the algorithms to actually go. So you have to have heuristics in the software of computers for them to be good chess players. Well, that's going to mean you're going to treat them just like humans who have heuristics, because we can't play chess algorithmically either. Um, but that doesn't mean they have intentions. Now, what is it to have an intention? That's a really good question. What creatures we're sure about are human beings. Do dogs and cats have intentions? The article that you wrote in German and Portuguese about Tungur in Germany talking about whether you should try rats in France in the 16th century because they're infecting towns and you want to execute them because they're blameworthy. Well, what do you have to think a rat is like in order to make it blameworthy? You'd have to actually think it has the attributes of personhood. You'd have to do what's called primitive animism. You'd have to anthropomorphize the rats as they did to think that they have intentions, they form them because of beliefs and desires. So in the article that you discussed with Tugner, um, the French court excused the rats for not appearing in court because it said, look, they're under threat from the citizens of France. And they know that if they show up, they're going to get clubbed because they're rats. So they have a perfectly good excuse for not showing up. That's to treat them as fully rational agents and give them an excuse that you would give to a fully rational agent. Turns out I don't think rats really like that. Neither, as far as we can tell, are your digital computers. They're both really good models, however, for certain intelligent processes. May, may I, I can elaborate a little bit uh, further? May I? OK. Um, one point is, we may treat them in the macro level as the same for, for legal purposes. But actually, the work is we don't. Not, not animals, not, not machines, not, but persons. Yeah. OK. But, um, let, let me uh, do the, the question with an example. Um, so we have the self-driving uh, cars, and we uh, have discussed a little bit on responsibility on it. So suppose in a, in a, in a first stage you have uh, you are you use a self-driving car and it causes an accident. So who is res responsible for that? You are just a, a passenger. But now, suppose you have a knob, then you, then you may choose altruistic driving, uh, selfish. selfish driving, and so on and so forth. Utilitarian driving. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, or neutral driving, I don't know. So then you start 
seeing responsibility for, for the test in general. But now, and this is a tendency in, uh, in the interaction of uh, human and, and, and robots or human and machines, which is to reach uh, hybrids. By, by that I mean, for example, suppose now that you have uh, uh, self-driving cars where you can um, uh, switch to manual and this, this, uh, there is a software that, that you learn your behavior in driving so then you have data about you but you have a program that reads and interprets your driving and then within this software uh, you are in a, in a moment where the car uh, is driving by itself, but based, in, based on your previous behavior, and it causes an accident. Yep. Then, then who would be uh, responsible in this, in this uh, sense? This is a, like it's a problem that we're actually going to face far beyond Google Cars. Because yeah. if you've been watching television the last 10 years, <laughs> it's very popular to talk about mind brain interface machines where you can control states of the exterior world not by using the Archimedean lever that is your body, but simply by thinking it. So that you can devise all kinds of machines that can speak for you, can write for you, can drive cars for you, can do all sorts of things for you. Um, if you know that you're attached to a mind-brain interface machine and use it as your means alternative to your body to effect an end, you're a fully responsible agent. Because then you have simply achieved your intentions through the use of the mind grade interface machine. The example I was going to give, if I'd done the other phenomenal one, is what I call the paralyzed patriot example. So the patriot that's going to alert Paul Revere whether the British are coming by land or by sea in the famous poem by Longfellow is paralyzed, which means he can't light the lantern in the church, one light or two, to show whether the British are coming one way or the other. So it looks like he can't do anything. But suppose the Patriot has a mind-brain interface machine that will actually read the readiness potential in his supplementary motor area so that if he wills the movement of his finger once, the machine will read that he's willed it once even though he can't move his finger. Then suppose you put a reader on that and then an amplifier on the reader and connect it to the light. Now he can make the light light once or twice by willing once or twice his movement of his finger, even though his finger won't move. Looks to me like a fully responsible agent because he's used the machine to move his body. So once you make Google cars, mind brain interface machines, so they read your desires, beliefs, and intentions at a time, you've got a fully responsible agent. You described an erratic Google machine. It doesn't read your choices, it reads your character. Yes. It reads what you would do if you were to make choices. Um, now that's interesting. That's the lecture my wife was giving this morning on the between Eritrean and Deonic Ethics. Should you be blamed that you've got a bad character that your machine is reading when you don't use the machine as the means to achieve these bad things? Well, I think the answer to that's probably no. I don't think you get blamed for bad character. Eritrean blaming is different than Deonic blaming. And although you don't invite people with bad character to dinner because they're odious, you don't punish them. They didn't violate their duty. So if you can truly design an irritated Google car, uh, I think you're off the hook unless you buy it, knowing it will read your bad character and do all the things you wouldn't let yourself do directly. Well, then you're responsible. And, and, and there's the complication. I think it's, it's exactly the point because then you're going to be judged not by your action but by your character as read by a software that interprets your character. Sure. So, and since the, the car is acting based upon this uh, interpretation of your character, then uh, uh, maybe uh, maybe the designers made a, a bad software that interprets yeah, yeah, wrong. It only gets interesting if you guys do your job right. And the yeah, artificial yeah. intelligence actually gets the machine. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all.